Yeah, so I'm going to pray first here, guys, because I'm a little nervous. <laughs> yeah, Father, we just, um, we come before you now, and we thank you for your presence in this space. We thank you that you are here and that you are real and that your word is true. Father, I thank, uh, just pray that the words that I say today are your words and not my words. That you touch hearts today if it's meant that these words that come out of my mouth are your words. We just thank you for the blessings that you give us every day. Right, so I'm going to diverge a little bit from the normal missionary spiel of this is what I do and this is what I do because I'm an administrator and I don't do anything. No, just kidding. Um, but um, one of the things that um, we've been talking a lot about in Romania is a different way of looking at the kingdom, a different way of what the kingdom looks like. And what we talk about a lot is the kingdom that turns everything upside down, where the first are the last, and the rich are poor, the sick are healed, and the guilty are set free, where the rules of logic just don't work anymore. And something that we've really been challenged about is what that actually looks like, what it looks like to walk that out what does it look like to serve in an upside down kingdom? What is an upside down kingdom? And I was thinking about what I was going to say to you this morning and I felt challenged. It's been something that's been banging around since Alan told me he wanted me to speak. Um, to share a little bit with you about what that looks like. What, that, what we think that looks like what that looks like for us as a body of people who serve in a place where people still believe that the Roma have no souls and can't be saved. Um, so I'm going to diverge a little bit, as I said, from the little bit of missionary spiel. I will show you some pictures at the end, I promise. Um, but right now I want to talk a little bit about what it looks like for us. And what I'm going to talk about is the story um, about Mary anointing Jesus just before he was crucified. Um, and that story is usually told to talk a little bit about, to highlight Jesus' life and his death and what that looked like. But one of the things that we've been talking about in Romania a lot is looking at that from a different perspective. Um, so that's what we're going to explore a little bit here. By John's storyline in the book of John, it talks about uh, Jesus' crucifixion. And this happens less than a week before Jesus is crucified. But... At the moment in this story, Jesus' life is just going on as normal. You know, he's kind of like hanging out with his friends and disciples. Um, he was, he's in the home of Lazarus. He just raised him from the dead. And his sisters, Mary and Martha, were hosting a dinner. And as is often the case when Jesus is around a table with his disciples, controversy will break out, something will happen, and it will look like um, someone will be unhappy, or someone will say something like, well, is that's not the way it's supposed to be. But Jesus always finds a way to make those moments a teachable moment. So this teachable moment happens when everyone is gathered around the dinner table, and Mary comes in, And the controversy was that Mary just poured a 
whole pound of high-end, she's fine, I don't have a problem, high-end imported perfume on Jesus' feet. It was nard. <laughs> it's just a weird word, isn't it? Nard. I'm going to put nard on my body. <laughs> so, um, But the thing about nard is it's got this dark, clingy, spicy, musky aroma that just permeates the whole room. It was used because the dead really stink. <laughs> so when you, when you anoint someone with this oil, it takes away the dead stink. So it's really an earthy, dark, deep smell. And so as Mary was using it, it permeates the whole house. It clings to everything. But did you know that this plant doesn't grow in Jerusalem? It's from the Himalayas. So in order for Mary to get that, it had to be imported. It's worth nearly a year's wages. That's a lot of money for a prostitute, you know, for someone who doesn't have a job, who, you know, that's pretty amazing. And I often, I, I think when we think about that, one of the things that we think about is where did she even get a year's wages? How did she afford to save enough money to buy this? And why did she buy it? I mean, she didn't use it on her brother. And that was dead, but she didn't use it on him. They were throwing this dinner party to honor Jesus because he just raised Lazarus from the dead. And so, yeah, it really, it, you, you wonder. I mean, when Jesus is opening the tomb, Martha says, we don't want to open that tomb. He's going to stink. <laughs> You know, in, in John eleven thirty nine, that's what it says. We don't want to open this tomb because this man is going to stink. So you wonder, really, why Mary didn't use that precious ointment to anoint her brother. That's, we think, because she was saving it. She was saving it because she knew something that a lot of people didn't know. She knew that this was to be used in preparation for Jesus' burial. And Jesus said that. He said it. So, um, so she used it that way. And that is um, something that you wonder sometimes how people would, how she would have known that. But God gives us different things to have different things with. And um, yeah. but the first time that Mary and Martha were mentioned um, in Luke 10, Martha welcomed him. And then Mary sat at his feet and listened to him. So she was more in tune with what he was saying than, than her sister was. And Martha was running herself ragged around the place going, my sister won't help me and I need to serve you all. Um, and then Martha says, or Jesus says to Martha, chill out, it's okay. You're worried about something that isn't going to matter in the long run. And Mary, Mary is choosing to spend time and sit with me. Paraphrasing. It's not what it says, but that's. But there's something about that story that makes it a little bit interesting because Martha's run the church. Without Martha's, there is no you know, cookies in the back room and coffee and cleaning and you know those kind of things. So... So we should never, ever 
discount when a Martha does. We should always try to be Marys as much as we can. But never, ever discount a Martha. Catherine is a Martha. You should never discount what she does in this church. Your wife is a Martha. She is important and a part of this church. But on this night, in the grand scheme of things, Mary was doing her usual sitting at Jesus' feet, and Martha was running around going, ah. So, but this time, this time, instead of just sitting at his feet and listening to him, she was anointing him and honoring him and really preparing him and worshiping and adoring. That's a pretty cool place to be if you really think about it. It's where I'd like to be all the time. Martha's a good woman, but she's sitting at Jesus' feet. That's got to be an amazing thing. But all, and all of the Gospels have a version of the story. But if we only had Matthew, Mark, and Luke's versions of that, we might think that Mary was just being wasteful. But in John, he makes it clear that Mary knows something that the rest of us don't know. The rest of his disciples don't know. She knows that Jesus isn't long for the world. And she's accepted that. She's done the very thing the rest of the disciples have refused to do. I mean, if you remember, most of the Gospels are where the disciples are going, you're not going to die. You're our king. You can't die. You know, you're, you're the one who's here to save us. You're not, don't, you're, there's no way you're going to die. None of them believe when he says, I'm not long with you. I'm not here. I'm not long with you. Mary does. So she knows that she will not always have Jesus. So this thing she does, rubbing this nard all over his feet and drying her feet with his hair and crying, it's very, very in the moment. But it's not impulsive. It's not wasteful. It's exactly the right thing to be done at that right time. Mary knows that the man who gave her back her brother will soon die. And she does the only appropriate thing. She pours herself out. She lavishes the costly perfume on her feet. She's pouring out her very being, her love, her thankfulness, her heart. She's giving herself in the most intimate way she can. And I know that that would make me really uncomfortable. And I'm guessing that if you were sitting at a dinner table and you saw a woman wiping someone's feet with her hair, that it would probably make you really uncomfortable too. But that intimate act of adoration and devotion was the perfect embodiment of worship in spirit. Her worship was extravagant, extremely intimate, and it cost her a whole year's wages. That's a cost for someone who doesn't have anything. It's about being sensitive enough to do the right thing at exactly the right time. All about being present with Jesus in that moment. She behaves as if there's no one else in the room. She's not afraid of giving too much or looking too foolish. I'm not sure there are very many of us who could do that. And a few days later, Jesus would get down and wash his own disciples' feet. Just as Mary had poured out her love on Jesus' then Jesus would do the same. 
for his disciples. And then not long after that, Jesus was mounted on a Roman cross for us. The feet that Mary had anointed were nailed to a cross. I think that the scent of her perfume would have just lingered on his body, that it would have still been there in the air, and it would have reminded Jesus that he wasn't forsaken, that he was loved, that there were still people who loved him. But this intimate act of worship and this extravagance of her gift, it was too much for almost everyone else in the room. Mark's version of the story says that some grew angry when they saw what she did. Matthew's version says this disciple saw it when the disciple saw it, they were angry. But John wants us to know that it was Judas who instigated this controversy, this anger at Mary. According to John, Judas Iscariot complained, this perfume was worth a year's wages. Why wasn't it sold and the money given to the poor? Mark said that some grew angry and said that. Matthew clarified that it was the disciples. But John wants us to be sure to know that it was Judas who actually started this. And John says, wants us to know that Judas said this not because he cared about the poor, because he was a thief. He carried the money bag and he would take whatever he needed in it. I've always wondered, how did John know that Judas was a thief? How did he know? If they caught him at some point, why was he still carrying the money? Why didn't they take it away? Did they figure it out later? What was he doing with the money? Where did he put it? Where did it go? It doesn't really tell us that. John doesn't answer those questions. He just wanted, to, wanted us to know who started this. Who started this accusation against Mary? Who said she's being wasteful? A traitor and a thief said that she was being wasteful. Someone who is fun fundamentally double-minded and self-serving. He's not the first, and he won't be the last, to pretend to care about the poor just to get something for himself. There are lots and lots of people who pr pretend to care about the poor to get their own agendas across. But you know what's really fascinating here is that Jesus doesn't even call Judas out for this. He doesn't publicly expose Jesus, Judas. He doesn't say, you cheating, backstabbing, two-faced, dirty scoundrel, you're only interested in having a year's worth of wages. That's what I probably would have done. That's probably what a lot of us would have done. But he doesn't. He just says, says to Judas, leave Mary alone. You will always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me. I've heard those words twisted a lot to say, um, doing justice to the poor against doing extravagant worship. So, but what Jesus is saying is it's more important to spend our resources on soul winning. Yeah. Or fine buildings or spectacular praise productions or life-size replicas of Noah's Ark complete with animatomic animals than on working with the poor and the oppressed. But really, remember though, that it's not Jesus who said that. 
it wasn't Jesus who said that you had to that buildings and working with the poor had to be extreme opposites. He didn't say that. Jesus didn't say Jesus didn't say you had to change choose one over the other. Judas said it. So if we talk about Jesus, he says you will always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me. And a lot of people think that to mean that Jesus is perfectly okay with inequality. It's perfectly okay with the poor. It's perfectly okay with not worrying about the poor. You know, if he said there'd always be poor people, then why are we worrying about poor people? If there's no solution, then is it really a problem? But Jesus was actually quoting Deuteronomy 15. In Deuteronomy 15, 1 through 11, is all about how the Israelites were supposedly to lend generously to their poor neighbors and to be sure to camp, cancel the debts in the seventh year. In verse 4 of Deuteronomy 15, it says, Of course there won't be poor persons among you, because the Lord will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. But only if you carefully obey the Lord your God voice. In other words, if the people of God obey the commandments to be open-handed with their neighbors and cancel the debts as God required, it should eradicate poverty. But then in verse 11 it says, Poor persons will never disappear from the earth. Or as Jesus said, you will always have the poor among you. Do you see why that's ironic? On one hand, it says, if you obey my command, that the poor people will not exist anymore. On the other hand, it says, the poor will always be among you. Why do you think that is? I suspect that it's because Moses knew that they wouldn't actually obey the commands. So far from baptizing income equality, from saying don't worry so much about the poor, you'll never solve the wealth in problem of wealth inequality, Jesus' point was actually, yes, do help the poor. You have the rest of your lives to do justice to the poor. But right now, only Mary knows what time is left. Only Mary knows what extravagant worship looks like. It's all about knowing what time. Not being asleep, but being awoke. And acting accordingly. You will always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me. And he says it in three of the four versions. In Matthew 26, um, it says, we talk, uh, oh, sorry, Matthew 25, we talk about the parable of the goats and the sheep. In the final judgment, Jesus tells the sheep, come, you who will receive good things from my Father, inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you. Before the world began, I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you took care of me. And all the sheep wonder, when did I do this? Who did I do this to? Where did that happen? I didn't remember that happening. I didn't give you any clothes. But Jesus says, I assure you that if you've done this for one of my brothers, one of my people, then you have done it to me. He says that he's adopted the poor, the needy, and the hungry and the thirsty, the homeless and the naked, imprisoned and enslaved people as his family, his brothers and sisters. And whatever we're doing for them, we're doing for him. In this way we do, in fact, always have Jesus with us. He comes to us 
as the poor and the sick and the hungry. He's with us in the flesh, in their blood, in their clothes, in their eyes, in their needs. And however we're able to reach out to them, when we do, we embrace Jesus. A year's worth of wages to make a dying man smell good. Jesus told Judas and everyone at the dinner table that night, and all who gathered in his name from then on, this perfume was to be used in preparation for my burial, and this is how she used it. Jesus was a poor man, a homeless man, and he was less than a week from dying. And Mary had just poured out a year's worth of wages to make sure that this man was going to smell good when he died. Bad investment? Poor stewardship? Criminally wasteful? That's what a lot of us would have called it. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus praised her for it. She's done a good thing for me in Matthew 26.10. So, what changes? Maybe it doesn't change anything in your way of thinking, but in our way of thinking in Romania so far, what changes when you hear the story thought, told from this point of view rather than Jesus' crucifixion? as a story of Mary doing something of extravagant beauty for a poor man, as a story of sacrificial kindness. I think that gives us permission to be extravagant. Not selfishly extravagant, not self-indulgent. But when Mary says, when Jesus says that Mary has done a good thing by spending a year's worth of wages to make a poor homeless man who's about to die smell good, that's an invitation for us to go and do exactly the same thing, to be extravagant. What would extravagant worship look like? What would it look like to sit at the feet of Jesus and pour out to the poor and the homeless? the unwanted, the ugly, the smelly. What would that look like? What would it do to our life as a church? What about our sense of community, of fellowship? How would that open our eyes? What might it mean to be to welcome each other extravagantly. What would it look like in our ministry? What would it look like with our neighbors? To love extravagantly, to give extravagantly. If we remembered that Mary poured out a year's worth of wages on a homeless man. Does that change how you see the homeless people? Does it change how you see the ugly and the downtrodden and your neighbors and your people in church, your real neighbors, your family here? It might look like giving up your leisure time, giving up because leisure time, you know, uh, to serve in a homeless shelter. It might look like taking a pay cut to work in a women's shelter. Or, uh, like in Romania, it might look like 20-somethings, kids, 18, 19, 20, 22, postponing their university, postponing their careers, to come and to pour out love in service for people who often aren't grateful who tell you, Vez cum tu. See, look at you. You don't care about me. Pouring out love, Vez cum tu. Ase viata. That's life. And you rarely ever get a thank you. What do you think? 
that extravagant worship might cost you. What if the point of this story, the message that Jesus really wants to stake from this, is that nothing we offer in the name of a loving God with all of our heart and all of our being, all of our will and our ability, and loving our neighbor as ourselves, no matter how extravagant it looks, no matter how crazy it sounds, no matter how criminally wasteful someone else might think it is, what if that's never wasted because you're pouring it out at Jesus' feet? And Voskamp says, we're not giving what we call to give unless that giving affects how we live. It affects what we put on our plate and where we make our home and where we hang our hat and what kind of threads we have on our backs. Surplus giving is the leftover giving of, all, of what you can afford. It's the leftovers. It doesn't cost you anything to clean out your closet and send your old clothing that you wouldn't wear again to Romania or to Africa or to the homeless shelter down the block. It costs you something if you go to the store and you buy new clothes and you send those to people. It costs you something if you take time out of your busy schedules to serve someone else. Sacrificial giving is the love gift that changes how you live. Because the love of Christ has changed you. God doesn't want our leftovers. He doesn't give us leftovers. He gave us his son. He would never give us leftovers. He wants our love overtures, our first overs. He wants the best that we have to give because that's what he gives us. He wants to be our first love. When we give our best, we are living our best. We are saying with our gift, you are valuable. You are redeemed. You are loved. We are saying that you are worthy of the best. And Jesus is the best. We have the opportunity to speak self-worth when we give generously. If we only ever give the leftovers, we're telling people that they're not worth the time and energy it takes. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that I do this well. That I'm holier than you are, or better than you are, or smarter than you are. You're probably all smarter than I am because you have retirement funds and jobs. <laughs> um, but I'm not. I'm just a simple woman living in a field in Romania with a bunch of other crazy people who kind of wandered into this idea that was planted in my head by someone who's probably just as crazy as I am. <laughs> Lowell Carlson. Um, but that turned into a call that I cannot avoid. There are days many days, many, many days when I wake up in the morning and I go, are we done yet? Can I go home? The answer is always, not yet. We're not done. <laughs> We're just kind of weird and crazy all by itself. And I wonder, what the heck I'm doing? I don't have a retirement fund. I'm almost 60 years old. I'm no, not as old as some of you in the room. But I'm almost 60 years old. I have no retirement fund. I see my grandchildren every two years. <laughs> um, I, every time I come back, I've lost friends. People get on with their lives and don't. You know? <sighs> but this is where God has nudged me to be. And these are the things that God is stirring in our hearts in Romania. And I am challenging you and the reason this happens the reason that I say is
is every, every great once in a while. Sorry. I get a glimpse of what it looks like, a teeny tiny glimpse of what it looks like to be loved extravagantly and to love extravagantly. And that's enough to make all of the hard and crazy times worth it. So my challenge to you is, what if your worship really looked like something? What would it cost you? What does it look like to be sacrificial in your giving? And what does loving extravagantly look to you, look like to you? And this, Kim, you can put pictures up now, is a little bit of what it looks like for me. And these are just pictures of the people that I work with and serve. I don't have anything profound to say or explain. It's, I just want you to see a little bit of what it looks like where I live to love extravagantly. To spend time with people who some churches won't let in, who are all church, they've all been baptized as Orthodox. Eastern Orthodox because that's the state religion but they've never ever been told about the extravagant love of Jesus their God is a wrathful God it's a God of rules and regulations and we serve them and we show them his love and we help their children go to school and we help them feed their families and we help them make a living so that they can know that they are worthy. Just like all of you are worthy of extravagant love. Some of the people I work with Mostly teenagers. 20 odds. That's not a people, by the way. Some of these kids have never been out of their village. Girak, the, this little lake, is only 20 minutes away. They'd never been. An example of where they live. <laughs> 